How many of you guys like noise? You like not being deaf, yeah, that's something. Like a, a noise to an extent. What was that, Alex? Let's phrase it that way. I like not being deaf. You like not being deaf, yeah, that's helpful. Uh, but for those of you that were really paying attention, you should have said, well, noise, what kind of noise, right? You should have had me clarify. It's okay. Don't worry about it. So what are we going to learn about today? Physics, well, that's exciting. How many of you love physics? Great. And then we're going to learn about some biology of audition. This is not like audition if you go over to the Jones C. Edwards Playhouse. It's not that kind of audition, right? Where you're going to like read a monologue and see if they'll cast you as Scrooge in the upcoming production of A Christmas Carol. It's the only thing Dickens were, wrote worth reading. The rest of it's a waste of your time. It's about some. It's all about some poor kid. I remember reading. Uh, I think it was in sixth grade. I ended up reading Great Expectations. Yeah. The entire book, I was like, "What is going on?" It took me until it took me watching the episode of South Park that spoofs that book to actually understand the plot of that book. Yeah, that's probably worth your worth more of your time than reading that book. I mean. I'm not generally someone yeah. who says like South Park has more value than classic literature, but in that case, I'll side with Alice. All right, so there's some learning objectives. Don't worry about that. We do want to think about sound, though, right? Why do we want to think about sound? Well, we're going to think about the auditory system, and that's awesome. But the first thing you need to know before you study any sensory system, and we're going to do this uh, with every sensory system, we're going to spend some time thinking about that stimulus, right? If we don't understand the stimulus, then we don't really understand why that sensory system is built that way, why that sensory apparatus is built that way, right? Uh, so we really want to think about sound for a while, the physics of sound, and then kind of match that with the biology. So that's cool. Uh, sound is this uh, you know, sort of pressure waves, right? Typically, we think about vibrating air molecules, <clears throat> although any molecule that can vibrate can technically transmit sound, right? Sound, uh, for those of you that live in one of those apartments with those really thick windows and, and walls, right, so you never hear your neighbors. Um, I don't know if anybody, right, Kaylin, might, might have one of those. You know more about your, your neighbors than you know about yourself. Um, <clears throat> so uh, sound can definitely travel through other, other substances, right? It travels at a different rate, and, and there's some filtering process we'll talk about. Uh, typically, if sound is traveling through air, we're thinking about 335 meters per second, which is pretty fast, right? This is the point of the lecture uh, where I am required to mention Chuck Yeager's name. It's in my contract. If you work in the state of West Virginia and you mention the speed of sound, you have to say Chuck Yeager at least three times. It's just uh, it's, it's a requirement. There's no way to dodge it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Chuck Yeager was the first person to break the sound barrier. You guys aware of that? You are now, so you know, now you can call yourself a true West Virginian. Kyle? Are we actually going to do that for the exam? Possibly. Right. But that is a <laughs> you, you never know, right? <laughs> you never know why. Can the question just be how many times you have to say his name? How many times you have to say his name? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's that. pretty. It's in, it's, trust me, it's in all state employee contracts. <laughs> Only if you mention speed. If you talk about anything else, you know, you're just don't have to randomly mention Chuck Yeager, but uh, but you know if 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 you mention the speed of sound, uh, you have to do that. <clears throat> or the movie The Right Stuff, which is you know there's a person in it who plays Chuck Yeager. I don't know if it means anything to anyone, but there you go. <clears throat> I used to have a Chuck Yeager autograph hanging on the wall in my office. <laughs> I took it down when I moved. I wouldn't tell people. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Uh, I don't know. There you go. So. Uh, what do we have? We've got compressions and refractions. Basically what happens is uh, air molecules get compressed and then air molecules spread apart, right? And that's how we carry that sound wave through, uh, through the air, right? So it'll go into your ear at some point. So it's kind of cool. So we have like increased air pressure and then areas of decreased air pressure. That's pretty cool. We can typically take a sound wave and take a slice through it. And when we do that, what we're left with is what's called a sine wave. 
Now, if you don't know what a sine wave is today, don't worry about it. If you don't know what a sine wave is in six weeks, start to worry. Because we're going to talk about sine waves a bunch, right? And starting now, we're going to talk about sine waves when we talk about sound. We're going to talk about sine waves when we talk about light. We're going to talk about sine, sine waves when we talk about visual uh, stimuli that you need <clears throat> for certain kind of tests. So we're definitely going to talk about waves and waveforms. So let's take a few moments, Bree, and let's just get ourselves oriented with uh, what a sine wave is. Right? Anybody a sine wave specialist? How many of you made it through trigonometry? Yeah, so you did something with sine waves, right? Yeah, you've heard of them. You know, it's like, what are those three funky buttons on my calculator? Oh. Sin, cos, and I don't know how they usually abbreviate. Tangent. Yeah, that's the other one. Tan. Tan, yeah. So that's, don't worry about how you calculate these things. I'm not going to ask you to do that. It's just the shape of a wave, right? <clears throat> that's all we want to know. And we can do things uh, to these sine waves, to these waves to make them different but still have some of the same basic features, right? So, uh, what we want to think about first is what we call amplitude. Right? When we're thinking about amplitude, we're thinking about how far above or below does it go so above, the, or, or above or below this sort of arbitrary zero point. Uh, we call it zero, but it's really just kind of the midpoint of the wave, right? So how far above or below are we going? That's going to be our amplitude. That makes some sense, right? It tells you like how powerful Right? Is this an inverse sound? We're thinking about how loud is that, right? Now, loudness is a, um, is a perception, right? That's something that you would indicate, Laurie, like, whoa, that was loud. Uh, that's not really an objective measurement, right? Whoa, that was loud. What is a, a measurement is uh, like decibels, right? And that's a measure of sort of like um, the pressure, right? And so the, the actual amplitude there. So that's going to be a sensation. So that's kind of where they're different. <clears throat> if we're measuring peak to peak, of course you could also measure trough to trough. Uh, we call that one cycle, right? So from the time you start at any one point, it's usually easiest to pick the top point or the bottom point. You don't want to pick, hey, how about a third of the way down? Well, a third of the way down to a third of the way down, that's still one cycle, right? That's kind of hard to find where that is. You know exactly where the top is. It's right there. So top to top, we think about that as one cycle. <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Right? When we start to think about frequency, right? so, so how, um, how close are these peaks? Right? So we think about how many cycles are there. Typically, we measure this over time when we're thinking about uh, sound. So how many cycles per second? Right? That doesn't mean that the sine wave or that the sound wave is moving faster. It's still moving at the speed of sound, right? which is at 335 meters per second. It just has more peaks close together. Right, instead of the peaks spread out. And that's going to be frequency. More peaks per second is a higher frequency. Okay. <clears throat> we'll think about that in a few moments. The only other sort of... Um, uh, so we've got frequency and, and peaks, one cycle. We talked about amplitude, right? <clears throat> the only other thing you want to think about is what's called orientation. And what this means is, is there another sine wave that's offset, right? And so what we could do is we could potentially offset a sine wave. We could have the same frequency, right, the same number of peaks per second, right, same number of cycles. Uh, and it can have the same amplitude, right, it's coming up and, and down just as far, but it's shifted a little bit in time, right? How many of you love to sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat? Alex, it seems like, no, you don't do that. I haven't in a while. Oh, well, you should, you should dust it off and try it again. Not right now, but, but, you know, like maybe when you go home, or better yet, when you're underwater. It's a great place to sing. Um, so, if you think about singing in rounds, right? It's kind of the same thing, it's just shifted in time, right? <clears throat> Mason? Um, when we're talking about tonal dissonance, do we measure that? Is that a measurement of uh, time or how far apart the cycles are? Total dissonance, what do you mean? Tonal dissonance. Oh, tonal dissonance. Yeah. If you're thinking about, <clears throat> anytime you're talking about a tone, it's frequency. Right. It's going to be how many, how many peaks per second. 
and it's whether or not we'll <clears throat> hang in there. Okay. If we don't get it this week, we'll get it next week. Okay. Next week we're going to talk a lot about harmonics and missing harmonics, and I, I think if you can hold on to it for like seven days. <clears throat> I forgot about it. You you will, but that's okay. Someone <laughs> else someone else will remember, and then it'll it'll come back. Okay. So let's hang on to that for a little bit. All right. Other questions about this basic sort of wage structure? Got it. <clears throat> All right, so here's what we just talked about. Sine wave, right? We talked about frequency. That's measured in hertz. That's how many cycles per second. Amplitude, that's the change in pressure. We measure that in decibels. Why is the B capitalized? Anybody know? Remember that guy who invented the telephone? Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah, his last name. Decibel, right? Uh, there you go. So it's kind of built into the name decibel. That's why the B is capitalized, just in case you're curious. Okay? And that, that's measuring a sound pressure level. Uh, the interesting thing about the decibel scale is it's logarithmic. You guys are familiar with logarithmic scales? Uh, earthquake scales are that way, right? So a 4.1 uh, sounds like something, and a 4.2 sounds like something worse. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you're moving, each unit that you move is worth more on a logarithmic scale. So the difference between a 4 and a 5 is less than the difference between a 5 and a 6, right? Because each time you go, it's kind of, instead of a linear scale, find my mouse, instead of a linear scale like this, it's a logarithmic scale, right? And so you kind of, each time you increase at a faster rate. <clears throat> so decibels are the same way. So if somebody says, oh man, that was like uh, 60 decibels, you're like, okay, whatever. And then somebody's like, well, then it was 65. I'm like, okay, that was a five decibel increase, right? Well, that means something. But if somebody goes from 70 to 75, it's still a five decibel increase. But that, those five decibels are worth more because it's logarithmic, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then we talked about phase. I used the word orientation here, uh, but it's, it's the same concept, right? Are you shifted in time uh, relative to that other wave? What's really interesting is if you shift it enough, right, if I were to keep shifting this guy over, these waves would actually just cancel, cancel each other out, right? And what you would end up with is nothing, okay? Because whatever uh, compression you're having would be canceled out by the refraction that you're having, right? So you'd just be right at that zero. So that's pretty cool, right? It's okay. It's okay. It's brilliant. <clears throat> I thought it'd be really great if, if on the outer edge of all car windows, right, they had this, right, like this device that would be sampling sound waves coming and going, and you could create this like super silent inside or outside of your car, right, and you could just kind of like ride in peace or walk down the street in peace and you wouldn't hear the noise coming out of other people's cars. Right. You should work. That work like that now. They do. It's the exact same thing, right? It's amazing. It is. It is. Those noise canceling headphones are brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Bose yeah. stepping up the game. Huh? So Bose is stepping up the game. They are. Yeah. Finally, it's about time. <laughs> Bose has never been known for you know like right. audio, <laughs> audio trend setting, right? Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, hey. So basically, what I just told you was an awesome story. Uh, but it was largely a, it was largely a lie, right? We, we talked about sine waves, and I said, hey, Skylar, sound waves, they're awesome. They're all just sine waves. That's brilliant, right? Go with that. The problem is that works for what we call like pure tones, right? And later today, you're going to create a pure tone using your phone, right? So you've got that app that's going to create a pure tone. It's just going to be a sine wave, one single sine wave. It's going to make a nice, you know, just clear tone. The problem is most natural sounds are much more complex than that, right? They're actually composed of several sine waves kind of riding on top of each other, okay? And when we do this, we're actually going to use the word called uh, timber. So have you ever heard of, uh, you know, someone's voice, they'll, it'll be described sometimes, they have a certain timber or, uh, I don't know, it's sort of an old person word. Uh, I've heard of timbre. Really? Yeah. I have like timbre no and harp, stuff like that. Like, I don't even know. I've heard voices, <laughs> voices that, having that timbre, but not. Uh, I think someone's mispronouncing timbre. Yes. That's what I would go with, Olivia. Okay. 
I think so. Uh, unless they're, you know, confusing with a tambourine. That could be it. That happens. Yeah. Uh, what we mean by timber, and there'll be some there'll be some slides on this later. Basically, you take one sine wave. It's not a gray sine wave, but just go with it. And then you add some other, like sine wave on top of that, and it makes this really sort of complex wave structure. How many of you are musicians? I think I've already asked this once, right? Uh, how many of you have ever listened to music? Yeah, that's something. Great. Um, if you haven't, you should try it out. It's been a great thing. The human species has been doing for millennia, like listening to and making music. You should give it a try. Uh, but Emily, what's interesting about this is, uh, so you know different instruments, right? So if I were to, to play a trumpet or a saxophone, you'd be able to know they're two different instruments, right? The cool thing, though, about a saxophone and a trumpet is they can both play the same note. They can both play the same frequency, and they can play that frequency at the same amplitude, but you still know that it's two different instruments. And that's because of timber, that complexity, right? All those other sine waves on top of that main sine wave. That main sine wave might be a C sharp, right? Okay, whatever frequency that is for a C sharp, and it might be at, you know, 85 decibels, right? You play a C sharp at 85 decibels, you can do that on just about every single instrument that, that is out there. Uh, but they're all going to sound different, right? And that's because they have those other little sine waves riding on top of that main sine wave. And that's what we talk about uh, when we talk about harmonics. That's a conversation we're going to have a little bit more next week, but this is sort of a, uh, a preview for that. Now, there's this complicated thing called a Fourier analysis, okay? Uh, this is one of those times when I do want you to think about math, but you don't have to do math. You just have to think about it, right, and know it exists. So just, just kind of put it there like, oh, that's math. That's fun. But we're going to talk about things you can do with a, so a sound wave, right, and what we can pull out of that. So this is actually a clarinet note. So I don't know if you guys know the clarinet. And if you were to map out the changes in amplitude and frequency of this over time, that's a very brief period of time. We're talking about 0 0.02 seconds, right? Sort of a brief period of time. Uh, you can see that it's got that nice jagged, it's repeating, but it's a nice jagged sort of uh, pattern. If we were to, to play a saxophone, play that same note, the saxophone's going to look different. You know, you're still going to have your same sort of repeating components. It's brilliant, isn't it? Same sort of repeating components. Just imagine that looks like it should, and you'll be fine. So uh, you're going to have that same pattern, but it's going to be slightly different, right, because it's a saxophone. What's cool about this is you can pull out from these complex waveforms the simple sine waves that make up that, right? And so you can do this mathematically. I'm not going to ask you to do it mathematically. I'm just going to show you a picture of it. I want you to think about it. So the first thing you need to do is pull out what we call the fundamental frequency, right? The fundamental frequency is always the lowest frequency. So, if you were to look at this collection of sine waves, right, Chloe? You're looking at that collection of sine waves, and you're going to say, which one has the lowest frequency? Okay, I'm going to tell you the answer, because I'm, I'm just going to trace it. This is going to be hard for you to describe, right? It's this guy right here. So if we're looking over this section of 0 .004 seconds, so we've kind of changed the scale down, we're just at this little area here. How many, how many cycles? Well, we, we've got a peak and then sort of another peak. So we've got sort of like one cycle in that period of time, right? Okay. Now that doesn't mean it's one hertz, because a hertz has to be an entire second, right? And we're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a second here. But if you look at these other sine waves, this gray guy here, I mean, look, we've got, we've got like four peaks, right? So that can't be the lowest, right? One is much lower than four. See, I, you know, Eli, I know I said no math, but there's a little math you got to do. One's less than four. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Pretty confident on that. Uh, and these other uh, frequencies, these other sine waves, they have even, even more peaks, right? And you can map those out. So that lowest frequency is called the fundamental. The other cool thing about the fundamental is it will have the highest amplitude, right? So you know two things about the fundamental already. Lowest frequency, highest amplitude. Well, that's pretty awesome, right? Okay, so you know two things about the fundamental. 
the fundamental is sort of the the sine wave that is giving that tone its its uh, its characteristic pitch. Right. We'll talk a lot more about that later when we talk about those harmonics and missing harmonics and missing fundamentals and some interesting things about pitch perception. But for right now, just know that's the guy who's really this frequency. If, if this is a C sharp, I don't know what note this is. Let's say it's a C sharp. By the way, that's the sharp sign. That's not C hashtag. For those of you that are uh, not as musically inclined, right? I don't know why Octothorpe never caught on. That's another name for that, right? The Octothorpe. Nobody knows that. It's, it's a true story. You know. Nobody knows. So let's say it's a C sharp. Uh, just let you know what's going on, right? This, if you heard this frequency alone, just that single sine wave, if you were good enough, you'd go, hey, that's a C sharp. You wouldn't need all of these other sine waves in here. These other sine waves in there, they tell you, hey, that's a clarinet doing a C sharp. If it's a different set of sine waves here in the middle, then you go, that's a saxophone doing a C sharp. Okay? But that fundamental tells you what it is. What we can do with that fancy Fourier analysis, right, Kyle, is we can take this and we can plot these things in a different way. Right? So what you can do is you can plot amplitude with frequency or, you know, that's phase with frequency. It doesn't really matter. Don't worry about that one too much. But if we're looking at amplitude and frequency, right, and we wanted to pick out which one of these dots represents the fundamental frequency. We could do that, right? And the reason we can do that is because what do we know about the fundamental? We know it has the highest amplitude and the lowest frequency, right? And so if you go, okay, well, which one of these dots has the lowest frequency? Well, I mean, that dot there looks like it's the lowest frequency. And then which dot has the highest amplitude? Well, that one has the highest amplitude, too. So that... Uh, that dot represents fundamental frequency. That one sine wave component of this complex sound. Does that make sense to everybody? If it doesn't, we're going to come back in a week and we're going to add something to this. So hopefully it kind of shifts around like a Rubik's Cube and you know, eventually get some of the same colored squares on the right side. You're not going to get them all there. But <laughs> but I think if you can get 70, 75 percent of them there, you'll be fine. So that's going to be more than what your cousin can do, right? Because you always want to do a, a better job on the Rubik's Cube than your cousin. Um, it's, it's never about completing it. It's just, well, I got more of them on the right side than you did. I'm sorry? I didn't know that was a thing. <clears throat> it is a rule. It, I, I, it's, I'm quite confident about that. All right. These other sine waves, the ones here in the middle, right? Not the, not the fundamental. They're all called harmonics. Okay. <clears throat> That's all. Now, the cool thing about a harmonic, this is really, really mind-blowing. They're all whole number multiples of that fundamental, right? <clears throat> so what's cool about this is when you do this Fourier analysis and you pull out these sine waves, uh, if this first sine wave is, let's say, 5 hertz, all of your other harmonics, all the harmonics, have to be multiples of 5, like whole number multiples of 5. So we're talking about 10, 15, 20, 25 hertz, right? You're not going to have a fundamental of 5 hertz and a harmonic of 27 hertz. It doesn't work, right, because it's not a multiple of 5. Again, we'll think more about that later. <clears throat> all right. I don't want you to think about this too much, but we do want to think about this filter. What is a filter? Uh, when we're thinking about this, a filter is something that's going to knock out some of the harmonics, right? It's not going to knock all of the harmonics out. Probably not even going to knock out your fundamental, right? Because the fundamental is that characteristic frequency. But if you look at this example, uh, we've got a complex sound wave comes into a filter. We've got a complex sine sound wave that comes out of that filter. But uh, Charlotte, it looks different, right? We've smoothed out some of the peaks here. Uh, we've changed the shape a little bit. It's still recognizable as the same thing, but it has been filtered. When you do that Fourier analysis and you look at this, what you notice is these higher frequency sine waves uh, have been deleted, right? They've been uh, filtered out. 
<clears throat> a filter will, will never add something. If it adds, it's not a filter. Filters only take out, right? So they only subtract. All right. Questions about that? So if we talk about a sound filter or something, this is all we're doing. We're just knocking out some of some frequency. Could have been the high frequencies, could have been low frequencies, uh, could have been frequencies in the middle, right? <clears throat> so there are things called a uh, high pass filter. Guess what that does? It passes through high frequencies. A low pass filter passes through low frequencies. And then you have the third one called a notch filter, uh, which passes through some notch in the middle, right? Some group of frequencies in the middle uh, for that particular sound. That's pretty cool, right? All right. <clears throat> Now, the cool thing about filters is you can actually, if you just send through a simple sine wave and you figure out what it does to that simple sine wave, if it's a linear filter, it's basically going to do the same thing to a complex sound wave. So you can sort of predict the outcome, right? So if you send through just one single sine wave and you say, hey, here's what happened to it on the, on the back end of that filter, then we can send through a complex sound wave and make some predictions about that. <clears throat> Why does that become important? Well, <clears throat> it's not something we're going to spend a lot of time on in this class. Um, but there are folks who are interested in analyzing uh, sound. Uh, musical instruments, here's that same uh, sort of clarinet note. And down here, we actually have uh, speech, right? So this is someone making different sounds. And you can see these dark areas. Uh, sort of represent the higher amplitudes, right, within that particular sound. I'm not going to ask you too much about these spectrograms, but just realize that is a thing that, that folks will do. All right. Other questions about that for now? Again, we're going to pick that back up with a little more complex discussion next week on this, but we want to kind of leave that where it is because we want to shift over and talk a little bit about the biological components that you have for um, for the auditory system. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. All right. So let's talk about the different parts of your ear, right? Everybody's typically got a couple of these, right? <clears throat> I mean, that's on average. You have two. I mean, it's possible to have more or less, right? Things happen. Is there actually a case for someone with three ears, or? I'm just assuming you could have three ears, right? I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming someone has been born with three ears. I'm not saying that's a common event, but I'm saying, you know, there are people falling out of uteruses all the time. Somebody's had to fallen out with a third ear. Yeah, I, I mean, it could have been a, I mean, it's going to be a, a, you know, a genetic defect situation, right? It could have been caused by a variety of things. I mean, would it be a defect? That sounds like an improvement. Well, it depends, right? Just think about the glasses you'd have to buy. I mean, it's got to have two earpieces on one side. Yeah. I'm assuming it's like two on one. Are you <laughs> thinking about four eyesight. like a third ear in the middle? What if they have perfect eyes? Yeah, it's just like a sunglasses. Forehead. Nobody likes to squint. <laughs> Same. Or a cat. <laughs> what if your third ear is like... But you can't, because then again, right, I mean, if you put a third ear up here, I mean, how far can you pull your hat down? Just get a tailor. Get a tailor, just like cut out one, I mean, ear cut out. I think you guys are going to make a lot of money making hats with an ear cut out. Because like, <laughs> you're going to have to sell, like, you're going to have to have, like, it's going to have to be Velcro, because, you know, they want the righty legs, because it might be the left or the right ear you have to, you're going to have to be able to switch sides. There you go. I'm going to send that into the patent office. A hat for someone with three ears. I bet no one has sent that into the patent office. I'm going to draw that up later. I feel like they would approve it. <laughs> but that's for like they would pure <laughs> fact that it's just so outlandish. I'm going to send in all these great ideas that I have to the. I'm going to have like 500 patents in the next year. Market is fashion. People will fashion? Buy it like crazy, yeah. yeah. You could even get a fake year. Yeah, there you go. Those bloody years you can get on Halloween. <laughs> oh. 
I thought that was from like dogs biting you. You got bloody ears, but maybe you guys are doing something different than I am. <laughs> the fake bloody ears you get on Halloween. Oh, the fake bloody ears. <laughs> hey, let's talk about not bloody ears, but let's just talk <laughs> about ears in general, right? Uh, so you've got this awesome thing on the outside of your ear called the pinna, right? It's known as the outer ear. It's a flexible flap. You guys have a couple of those, right? They're not just for holding back your hair or up, holding up your glasses, right? They actually do a ton of important things, okay? And I've been telling people for years uh, that I'm making a little bit of an assumption about your age. I'm going to assume that most of you are younger than me um, by at least a decade, right? I think that's a fair estimate. Somewhere between 1 and 1 1.5 decades, I think, is a, is a reasonable estimate for how much younger you are than I am. Uh, right? Maybe two. Two? I don't think <laughs> any of you... None of you are that bright, <laughs> to be, <laughs> because I, I've, I've read some lab reports already. None of you are bright enough to have been Damn. here uh, that early. Damn. <laughs> that was unnecessary. Yeah, but, you know. Course well, evaluations. Course course evaluations. Course. I'm not as worried about course evaluations at this point in my life. Um, so. Do you have tenure like Don? No. No? <laughs> it's next October. <laughs> we'll see what happens then. Uh, so. You've got that pin on the outside. The interesting thing is, uh, how many of you have earbuds? Yeah, I should have asked that at the beginning of class because then I would know I need to yell a little bit. Uh, because earbuds are going to cause you to lose your hearing. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate. And you're going to lose it sooner than people who are older than you that don't use earbuds. Uh, and your generation is going to be the first generation to lose their hearing before the generation in front of them. And I'm going to laugh at you. You're not going to hear me. Uh, you're just going to see my facial expression when I do it, but I'm definitely going to laugh at you about it. Uh, because I've been telling people this for a long time, that it's a bad idea to bypass something evolution gave you for hearing, right? There's a reason it's there on the side of your head. Okay? It has nothing to do with glasses, right? These guys came out long before Ray-Ban, I promise you. Okay? The cool thing about your pen is everybody's are different, right? They're all shaped slightly different. If you look at everybody's ears, that and I, we can have discussions about lobes and folds and wrinkles, and I don't want to. Okay, they're all different, right? The cool thing about that is, is in general, the size and the shape and the location of your pinna is that it has this really awesome effect by amplify about by amplifying medium sound frequencies, somewhere between 1,500 and 7,000 hertz. That's what we call a medium sound frequency, okay? Now, why would we want to amplify sound frequencies that are in that 1,500 to 7,000 hertz range? Anybody know a really important sound that's being made right at this moment that's probably falling between 1,500 and 7,000 hertz? Speech. Human speech, right? Typically falls in that range. So it would make a lot of sense to develop a pinna, right, shaped to amplify sound frequencies of human speech. Human speech is obviously very important to humans, right? That's why human ears are shaped differently than cat ears. Cats aren't really, I don't know, anybody have a cat? It does not care what you say at all, does it? <laughs> not at all. Human speech Three is cats. not it. Yeah. It cares about the sound of treats. It right. Really cares when you open that. up a metal can, they're yeah, right. Those things are important to it, right? Yeah. Not you going, hey, Charlie, I don't know the name of your cat. Uh, I'm assuming his name is Charlie. Uh, some cat's named Charlie. Uh, hey, Charlie, guess what I did today? I had a great time at school. It just goes, it probably licks its own butthole. Uh, because that's what cats do. Cat ears are not attenuated. They're not built to attenuate human speech. Human ears are, right? It makes perfect sense. Okay. So, human ears, that's why, you know, it makes sense. It's a perfect match between the frequency uh, of most of our voices and, you know, the shape of your, your penis. So that's pretty sweet, right? Yeah, and Alex? Uh, so, yes. like, assuming human ears have evolved as we have evolved. Certainly. Uh, there are languages that, like, way, way back before even there was civilization, they had to communicate with languages of some kind mm -hmm. were did ears evolve along <clears throat> with language so to speak like as people started coming up creating different and different languages 
Were that's they a, impossibly evolved with them? That's sort of an interesting question. Um, I think... Or is it more just the sound? It's just the sound. Okay. It, because if, if you listen to someone... I, I mean, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you were born in Vietnam or if you were born in Norway. You have the base... And there, there are some... I don't know if we talked in this class about stretchy vocal cords. Uh, okay, so at some point we'll talk about stretchy vocal cords. Uh, and maybe today's a good day to do it. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Uh, aside from the stretchy vocal cord story that I might tell you at some point in the future, either immediate or distant, uh, you're going to make the same frequencies, right? The, 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 the vocal apparatus of a human's the same, right? It's largely been the same for millennia. Uh, and that's probably true if you were to go back, uh, even a, a, a species or two back, the ability to create sounds has been largely the same, right? Now, whether or not we formed that into words like dog or, you know, fish or whatever, uh, that, that doesn't matter so much as the frequency of the sound itself. And there are, there are certainly other sounds in that same frequency as well, right? It's not exclusive to human speech. There are, you know, tons of sounds between 1,500 and 7,000 hertz. So do people who have bigger ears, are they able to hear better? That's a great question, but uh, I, I think if you had a bigger ear, you might be able to, I don't know, right? I'm thinking like, but I think it would have to be like a massively bigger ear. Yeah, but they have like the UFC fighters where their ears are like... Cauliflower ears? Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a different situation yeah. too. And so, Kyle, that's actually pretty cool. So, is the, it? I mean, not really, but, <laughs> but it brings up an interesting discussion here, right? So the cool thing about this is, is each of you have an ear that's shaped a certain way, right? A uh, that's shaped a certain way. And your, the rest of your sort of auditory system has developed around that, right? And so when you're attenuating those sounds and they come in and they sound a certain way to you, right? If you were to have a, like an ear transplant uh, or you had a cauliflower ear, things are going to sound weird. For a while, right? Because, and you can even do this, right? If you just take your ear and kind of, like, like squeeze up one ear, right? And then things are going to sound differently than if they, uh, uh, than if you have your ears open, right? It's not so different that you're like, wow, that was uh, sounded like an airplane, and now it sounds like you know a dog. But it, it is going to change the quality of the sound that you're receiving right? to you, right? And then you, you, of course, can get used to that. You have some cortical plasticity, but your cortex is kind of tuned to the way you're attenuating specific sounds right now. So, that was actually a pretty good question. Nice. Uh, try to avoid getting hit in the ear or anywhere else but, uh, but the ear. Yeah. You guys know about cauliflower ear? Anybody not know about that? Okay, that's fine. So, you'll see this a lot in like boxers, wrestlers, um, MMA fighters, right, whatever. If you get hit in the ear, it can cause some problems with like blood flow and whatnot, and you'll see that the inside of their ear kind of like swells up. It looks like cauliflower. You guys have probably seen it, right? Anybody not seen a cauliflower ear? You've not seen it. Wow. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. No, you're going to see that bad. It's gross. It looks like a flat ear. No, it's gross. It's beautiful. See right there? It is. Yeah. Right, 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 right below cauliflower pizza crust. They're gross. They're not. They are gross. I mean, they're not great, right? So. Uh, that one's yeah. pretty, these, yeah. some of these are pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, some of them are not as bad as others, right? See, yeah. see how homeboy's got like huge ears? Do you yeah. see those things? This one, yeah, that's just... To, no, to the left. One to the left. Of the oh. Left. That guy. Yeah. Like, look, look, you can't tell me that he can't hear like an ant crawling on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, that's kind of, it happens to a lot of folks, rugby players. You'll see it. Apparently Ronda Rousey has cauliflower ears as well. If your ears are like out from your head a little bit, does that not make it hard to hear things behind you? Uh, or like take it a little bit longer to get to you? Yeah, so, so wow. Read those are brilliant questions. Um, can you hold on to those for seven days? Because we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, well actually a little bit today we'll talk about sound localization. Uh, we'll do that some next week maybe as well. Um, I think, so here's the deal, right? Uh, if, if, how many of you have seen other people's faces? Yeah, right? So the awesome thing about faces is, I mean, they're all different, right? And they're all very different, right? Unless, I mean, there are times where you're like, hmm, 
I don't know, those two people look pretty similar, right? And it happens, like with identical twins, for example. Or, uh, you know, body doubles for world leaders, okay? Uh, they do this all the time. That's a, that's a Dr. Hinton class, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> By body doubles, uh, conspiracy theories. You'll have to ask him about that. Uh, the point is, most of us, even, how many of you know identical twins? Yeah, can you tell them apart? Okay, so there's a problem with you, but you can. You should be able to, right? Because there's still like minor differences, right? So in my high school class when I graduated, there were like seven sets of twins or something. I don't know. I... Were you living in Chernobyl? No, I wasn't. But uh, there were a number of identical twins, and I've, I've known some of them since I was like in preschool. And so, you know, most people are like, I can't tell them apart. I'm like, well, you know, like you got to look at their teeth because like one has a little tooth that sticks out a little bit on one side, and the other one has it on the other. And then, one eyebrow, you know, it's like these like small things, right? Uh, but there are differences. And so faces are awesome. They're great, uh, so you don't get them mixed up. Okay, to us, I'm, I'm looking out at all your faces, and they're all completely different, right? I'm like, oh man, they're all. But then if I want to step back and I'm going to go, you know what? Let's imagine I'm a crocodile for a moment. And I'm looking at your faces, they're all the same. They got a couple holes, they got some flaps, I don't know, right? Uh, <laughs> They're all the same, right? And so if you look at faces, they're all the same, really, right? They all have noses. You got a couple eyes, a mouth, and ears, chin, forehead, whatever. The rest is all minor variations, right? So well, maybe your forehead's a little bigger than mine, or a little smaller, or chin sticks out, or you got a little dimple in the middle, or I don't know, right? Whatever. It's still a chin, it's still a forehead, and I think with ears that's going to be the case, right? Yeah, you think that guy's ears are really big. But they're nothing. If an elephant looks at you, they're like, oh, man, look at all those people with those little ears. Uh, and so I think when you average it out across the species, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. The second thing you have to, to think about is the outside of your ear is not the only determining factor for what you hear, right? There's like a bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about on the inside. And just because you've enhanced, so to speak, you know, one component of your auditory system, unless you enhance the rest of it, it doesn't really matter, right? I don't know. Anybody into making race cars? Nobody makes race cars? Skylar, I, I really had you pegged I mean, like for a Formula One race. I don't know what you call them. I don't know. They make, it's like wood and you make so it go. Box box? Yeah, those things. I made that in, in high school science class. That's exciting. I know. Uh, how many of you have a car? Have seen a car? Right? And you know it has an engine and it has like a transmission. Uh, most of your cars don't have a rear end um, because most of them are going to be front wheel drive vehicles, right? So like the transaxles in the front, okay? But if you have like a truck, right? Anybody drive a truck? Anybody seen a truck? Yeah, so in the back they have those kind of like, have like a rear end to drive the back wheels, right? Instead of the front wheels spinning, okay? Uh, here's the thing, right? So oh man, I want to make my car go faster. So what are you going to do? You're going to put a big engine in it, right? So I'm going to take an engine from a Corvette and I'm going to put it in my Honda Civic, <laughs> right? But I'm going to leave that Honda Civic transmission in there. Nope. Nope, no, no, <laughs> right? Mason, where's that car going? Nowhere. It's not doing anything, right? And so just because I've jacked up one part of my car, if I don't jack up the rest of it to match, I've wasted my time, right? So if, let's make my ears giant. But if I didn't change the sensitivity of my cochlea, my inner ear, I didn't change my cortex, I'm not getting anything out of that. Right? Now I've just got big ears. <laughs> so when it comes to like earbuds, would that make headphones more effective? You know, like the Beats, the ones that you got cover? it over the ear. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of paying like $300 for something right. to stick on your head. Right. Um, glasses, I guess, are the exception. Cause <laughs> you can see. I'm not a fan of like $300 like headphones. These were $300. So that's too much. Yeah, my nephew for Christmas wanted a set of Beats. I know, he's like 12. <laughs> what are you doing with Beats? He's like, I'm, I'm buying the $5 he's, with the phone. Play like, I don't know, what do they play now, Fortnite? Yeah, no, he, instead he got a Switch for Christmas and he just kept playing Fortnite. It's like, hey, watch this. He's got a pickaxe. I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Bust up that barrel. <laughs> and then they're gonna go. Next, you should actually give him a pickaxe and say, "Now go dig a shelter to I, sleep in at night." I know, right? I was like, "That's a better, that's a better Christmas." Yeah, we need an expansion on our house. Get some material. Send them out. Send them out the neighbors. Go to do some actual mining. Yeah, that seems like a plan. Uh, yeah, so I, over the year is going to be better, Olivia. So, yeah. so buy over the year. Uh, you know, there's some reasonably priced options, right? That you can get the, the in the ear ones. They hurt too. 
Yeah. After a while. And, and you're going to lose your hearing. And I don't want you to do that because I still want to be able to yell at you in a few decades. And you think we'll know each other that long? I, I will. I have that. I, I mean, I'll just like randomly see you in town somewhere Probably. and I'll just yell at you. Well, you don't have to be this town. It could be some other town. You'll never know. You'll never know where I'll see somebody I know. It happens all the time. The Atlanta airport. The Atlanta airport. I'll never go to the Atlanta airport. Now you said it, now you will. So my wallet fell out, and so did a pair of glasses I don't even own. The wallet's mine, but I don't know where the glasses came from. They fell out of your pocket? Well, <laughs> they were down there where the, where the wallet was. I don't know. That was sort of an interesting thing. They weren't there earlier today. Anybody missing glasses? Nobody's missing glasses. I think so. Need a pair? All right. So, re-asking about like ears is actually really great, right? Localization and things. And how often do you find yourself like tilting your head around like this to try to locate a sound? It happens all the time, right? And it's because you're changing the way your pen is oriented to that sound and to, to try to attenuate, um, attenuate that. In particular, what's interesting is the elevation of the sound source, right? You're particularly sensitive to that when you rotate your, or change the orientation of your pen. You can kind of help pick up where that sound's coming from, whether it's, uh, you know, low to the ground or high. That's kind of fun stuff. All right, let's go to the middle ear, right? You've got these things called ossicles. These are the small bones in the middle of your ear, right? They're going to vibrate. They're going to jam on this thing called a tympanic membrane or the eardrum. It's pretty cool. There's some fluid in the inner ear, right? So once we get in there, the, the deal is uh, sound coming in is kind of like skipping a stone on water. How many of you guys have done that before? You've skipped some stones on water. That's cool, right? Uh, sound is like that when it comes in and it hits that fluid. Right? And so if it were to just come in and hit the fluid of your inner ear, it would just bounce right off. That sounds like a bad idea if you actually want to hear something, right? So what we've done instead is we have these um, auditory ossicles in there that take those sound waves and they change that. They kind of amplify it. They kind of leverage it, wedge it, so that then we'll actually cause some vibration of this. Uh, it's called endolymph, right? We talked about the same stuff when we talked about the vestibular system. Remember the endolymph in there? It's the same thing. But if that, uh, we call it an impedance, basically it's, uh, you know, it's, it's much harder to move through water than it is through air, right? So when you hit the water, you have to be, you have to have a little more force behind you to actually get is, you moving. Is that why your ears pop when you go so far? So like, say you jump off the diving board. Those are pressure differences. Okay. Uh, you're trying to, you're, I'm with you. Okay. That's more with like tubes inside and mm -hmm. fun stuff like that. All right, so middle ear, once we get there, we go to the inner ear. Again, we have the main guy there. It's called the cochlea, right? It's a coiled up tube. It's kind of cool. The cochlea is divided down the middle, right? And basically, you have these hair cells kind of hanging down, and they get deflected when sound waves come through, right? So we can kind of move that along. Here is your cochlea. It's unrolled, right? Here's the stapes. That's uh, the last of the inner ear bones or the middle ear bones, it's going to jam around on this opening in the cochlea called the oval window, right? And it's going to cause vibration of that endolymph out through the cochlea, okay? What's cool about this is there are cells along the cochlea, and they're organized in this really sort of interesting way so that uh, as you move along, there's a steady change in frequency, right? Uh, frequency sensitivity. Will we need to know the basic structure of this for the, for the exam? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to like label this, but conceptually okay. you should have some idea if that makes sense. Okay. There's, and there's not going to be any kind of labeling on the on the test. Like I'm not going to give you a, like an ear and say, hey, label the parts. Oof. All right, so we're going to send that frequency through, and then it's going to deflect hair cells that are in there. This displacement is going to peak, that wave is going to peak at a specific location along the cochlea, right? And that peak is going to coincide with the frequency of the, uh, of the waveform that's coming in, right? Is that what cochlear implants do? Cochlear implants by, 
pass this process. Right, that's like they substitute, so they act like. Yeah, so there's a problem with the cochlea, right, with the cochlear implant. You've got a microphone on the outside of your head. It's going to collect those sound waves, and then it's going to bypass the cochlea and go straight into the auditory nerve. And because of this ordered organization, Olivia, of the cochlea from, you know, high frequency to low frequency, the auditory fibers coming out of there are organized the same way. And so what we can do is we can have this microphone collecting these frequencies and we go, okay, well, if it collects a high frequency, then that signal needs to go out this wire. We're going to plug that right into the auditory nerve fiber that handles high frequencies. And then we've got one for middle frequencies. And of course, it's obviously more detailed than that, right? Because it's not just like high, medium, and low. Right. There are specific you know, frequencies there, but it, it, that is the idea. And you can bypass the cochlea altogether. The problem with that is the software that they use to, to sort of translate that's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, it's getting better and better, and so folks are we're better able to collect that sound and translate that into something meaningful in a way that it's gradually getting better for folks with cochlear implants. I don't know, does anybody, anybody know someone with cochlear implants? They want to share that? No, nobody. Nobody knows anyone, or nor do they want to share it. One of the two. I, like, used to. I don't know what that kid's doing now. I mean, he's a grown adult. We were very small when we knew each other. Yeah. So there you go. No, it's, um, you'll see they, they have, uh, this is like a round circle they have behind their ear, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the receiving apparatus. And then it just goes in, bypasses the cochlea. So the difference between that and a hearing aid is like, uh, yeah. a hearing aid kind of just like amplifies, amplifies? the sound. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about different kinds of hearing loss later. There are basically three kinds. We'll talk about that. All right, don't, I don't know what happened here, uh, but the picture's dropped out. Basically, we call this a frequency to place code. The basic idea is that um, high frequencies, right, are going to cause maximum displacement, what we call near the base, right? The base is going to be kind of stiff and rigid, and so those high frequencies are going to vibrate that selectively. Low frequencies are going to vibrate something out near the apex, right? Let's call it the apex. Uh, and so that's gonna, it's going to be sort of uh, more flexible out there, right? And so you're going to be able to, you know, a lower frequency is going to have a bigger impact out there than it does <coughs> on that, uh, on the stiffer part that's closer to the base. And the cells lined up along there are going to be sensitive to those particular frequencies. And so when they get activated, right, when they have that maximum displacement of that fluid and they're moving those, remember those cilia that hang down on the hair cells in the vestibular system? Same idea here. Uh, when those get deflected the most, then we go, hey, that's what frequency we're hearing. Depending on where that is from one end of the cochlea to the other, then we know you know that frequency. All right, so we should talk about hair cells just a bit. You've got, you know, 3,500 or so of these. Uh, again, they have these uh, cilia that stick down. When there's that fluid displacement, it moves those cilia, right? And that creates some kind of change in voltage. Basically, it activates that cell, sends a signal through the auditory nerve. Okay? Not a big deal. There is this thing called phase locking. You don't have to worry about this too much. But uh, because the frequency is coming in, right, whatever that frequency is, your hair cells are going to be stimulated at that frequency, right? Because that's the frequency of a physical stimulus coming in. It's going to deflect those hair cells at that frequency, which is pretty cool. Uh, you've got these things called outer hair cells. I'm not going to ask you a whole lot about these. These are not the ones doing sensory transduction, right? Inner hair cells are doing sensory transduction. They're taking that sound wave and turning it into an electrical signal okay, that our brains can understand. The outer hair cells do something really cool. Um, and they actually sort of amplify and sharpen the response of those inner hair cells. So what they will do is they'll kind of tune those cells to a certain range of frequencies or amplitude, and they'll they'll kind of uh, tweak that response a little bit, so we get a maximum and uh, accurate response to that. Those kind of come most in handy when you're trying to listen to something that's extremely quiet. Uh, quiet or loud. Uh, it really it, it, there's a I don't know if you know much about gain control. So basically, with gain control, is like let's say I tell you, and this is relatively true, you can you can hear um, any you know, any, let's say, 25 decibel range that you want, okay? 
Uh, and so what you have to do is, you know, if you want, if you want to hear more than from zero to 25, or you want to hear from 25 to 50 or 50 to 75, you have to shift where you put that 25 decibel range at any time, right? Your outer hair cells help with that process, making sure that, because you have a limited amount of sensitivity, but you have to make sure that you've got that sensitivity tuned in the right places. Does that make sense? Well, again, we'll hit this again in more detail next week. So, like, when you go somewhere with, like, loud sounds like a concert and your hearing is kind of muffled when you leave, is that kind of what is protecting it? Or what exactly is kind of creating that muffled sound? It'd be kind of like noise, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, some of that's in, I mean, again, unfortunately indicative of some long-term hearing loss, right? Uh, so you've caused some damage. Uh, mm. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, you know, let's just, let's just be honest about that. You don't wear earplugs when you go to concerts, do you? Uh, because otherwise you just watch it on TV at home. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're probably, that's probably indicative of some actual damage. Could be short term, could be, you know, temporary, but, but definitely damage. More than what you're going to have. I mean, you do have some outer air cell business. We'll talk about it more when we talk about amplitude. All right, uh, what else do we want to get out of this? No. All right, we just talked about that. Uh, coding intensity, again, uh, you can't hear something that's, uh, you know, you've got a 100 decibel range. Unfortunately, uh, that range is only 20 to 50 decibels at a time, right? Again, you have to kind of shift, uh, shift that intensity range up and down as you need to. This is the sort of the auditory pathway, right? So if you start in the left ear or the right ear, what's interesting here is you, you have uh, you have information that crosses from left to right. You also have information that does not cross, right? And then you have information that crosses like to different places, and it's a very complicated mess before you get up to the thalamus and cortex, right? And so we talked about thalamus and cortex a little bit, uh, you know, that first week or so. The reason you have this sort of crisscross mess down here is because you're trying to do what's called sound localization, right? And if you compare the input of sound to your left ear to the input of sound to your right ear, that can give you a good idea about the location of that sound, right? If something arrives sooner to your left ear, guess where it's located? To the right. Right. So it's to the left, right? I mean, whichever way it goes, I mean, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, these differences can be quite small, right? Again, because we're talking about the speed of sound, 335 meters per second, right? If something's only slightly to your left, what's the time difference? Because, you know, your head's what, like this wide? You know, I mean, and if you're traveling 335 meters per second, how fast are you covering the width of your head? Uh, we're talking milliseconds, right? I mean, it's a very, very, very short time span. Time frame, so you have to be very, very sensitive to that, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. So we have what are called interoral time differences, ITD, right? So we're measuring the time difference of sound arriving at the left or the right ear, which works for, for, for most frequencies. There are some frequencies, we'll talk more later about this, where that doesn't work as well. And in those cases, we want to use what we call interoral level differences. So one of the other things we know, Chandler, is that over distance, sound amplitude decreases, right? Uh, and you know this, how many of you have ever heard a train? Yeah, how many of you have heard that train when it was miles away and heard that train when it was right in front of you? And it's completely different, right? This, this, the intensity of that, the train's not making more noise when it's closer to you, it's simply closer to you. Right? And that sound hasn't, amplitude hasn't decreased over, over space. Again, right. huh? Is it the same reason that when something passes you, it changes as it passes you? Uh, that involves some Doppler effect we could talk about as well at some point. But yeah, as it gets farther away from you, that sound is going you know, to yeah. decrease. Um, so we have internal level differences as well, right? So because your left and your right ear are some space apart, the sound that arrives to one ear is going to be louder 
or more intense than when it arrives at the other ear, right? And we can measure that as well. Our brains are doing that calculation. Again, because your head's like only this wide, that's a really, really small amount of decrease, right? So again, you're very, very sensitive to this. All right. Once we get up past that sort of crisscross mess, we get up to primary auditory cortex. The cool thing about primary auditory cortex is it's mapped out what we call tonotopically, right? Which basically means we take that organization from the cochlea, right, that was from like high to low frequencies, and we map that onto your primary auditory cortex. So if you were to move along primary auditory cortex, you would move through cells that are sensitive to frequencies from, from high to low or low to high, whichever direction you're going, right? So you're not going to go, well, this one's sensitive to 1,000 hertz, and that one's sensitive to 800 hertz, and that cell's sensitive to 1,700 hertz. You're not going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. You're going to start high and go low or start low and go high, right, depending on which way you're moving. So here you go. This is your primary auditory cortex. If you move from here, that's high frequency to low frequency. Now, when you go into the secondary sort of auditory area, you just make a mirror of that, and you go low to high and then you go into tertiary, you go high to low. So it does flip-flop, but you're still moving in that ordered fashion, right, as you move from through, through one particular region. All right, uh, descending stuff. Again, that's all going to go out to your outer air cells. Don't worry about that too much. All right, I think that's the end. Any questions, comments, concerns? It took me just a small bit longer than I wanted to. That's okay.